This is algebra 2 lesson 1-2, properties of real numbers. There's a lot of uh, vocabulary for this lesson. Make sure you get a copy down, but it should be review vocabulary because we've done this before. The opposite, or additive inverse, are numbers that are the same distance from zero on the number line, but in opposite directions. The sum of a, num a number and its opposite is zero. For example, the, op uh, the opposite of six is negative six. The opposite of negative 14 is 14. A reciprocal or multiplicative inverse for of any non-zero number if a is one over a. The product of a number and its reciprocal is one. So if I have the number two thirds, its reciprocal then is three over two. The reciprocal of four and one half, the first thing you have to do there is get it into an improper fraction, which would be nine halves. The reciprocal of nine halves is two ninths. The reciprocal of a negative number is still a negative number. The reciprocal of negative one fourth is negative four because the product of a number and its reciprocal has to be a positive one. So if a number is negative, its reciprocal is also negative. Natural numbers. Natural numbers are your counting numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. We start with one, we get it, go on. Whole numbers are your counting numbers, but we add zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, etc. Integers are negative and positive whole numbers. We deal with a lot of integers. Rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction of integers. That means somewhere along the line, it can be written as a fraction of a whole number divided by another whole number. This includes repeating and terminating decimals. For example, four-fifths is a rational number. Two is a rational number. Uh, 3.7 is a rational number because all of those can be written as a fraction of a whole number over another whole number. Okay. Repeating decimals, 0.6 repeating, is also a rational number because it's actually two-thirds. If you load it as a fraction, it would be two-thirds. So all of those are rational numbers. An irrational number is any number that cannot be written as a fraction of integers. Non-perfect squares are irrational numbers. For example, the square root of 2 is an irrational number. The square root of 13 is an irrational number. Pi is the most famous irrational number. It's a number that cannot be written as a fraction of a whole number over another whole number, or it's a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. For example, if I had 2.173568927459, and it kept going and going and going and going and going without any discernible, repeatable pattern, then it's what we consider an irrational number. Real numbers are all irrational and irrational numbers. Essentially, if you wanted to classify a number, you first determine if it's real, which that's all you know right now. Later on, we will get into the imaginary number system. Then you determine whether it's rational or irrational. And if it's rational, it can be further divided into an integer, a whole number, a natural number, or a counting number. Right? So you can classify numbers based upon these types of definitions. OK, let's classify something. So as bankers and investors use the rule of 72, which is modeled by y equals 72 divided by x, where x is the percent interest rate and y is the years it takes an investment to double. Which set of numbers best describes the number of years y it takes for an investment to double when x is a natural number? OK, we know this is a real number. We also know that it is a rational number because it's a fraction. Right? This equation is a fraction. Okay. It says which set of numbers describes best describes the number of years it takes for an investment to double. Since the, since the number of years is normally in a whole number unit, it could be like four and a half years, though. So the best example of this, if you go back to your definition here, the best example, it's not a natural number, it's not a whole number, because it could be an integer. Okay. It could take... 4.6, but it's not going to be negative. It's never going to take a negative number of years. So most likely, it's a rational number. It's best described as what we would call a rational number. Okay. That's the best description that it is. Okay. All right. Graphing numbers on the number one. This should be very basic and very good to read through. Okay. 
You're going to determine enough if the number is an integer. If it's an integer, if it's an integer, that means it's a whole number. Then determine whether it's a positive whole number or a negative whole number. If it's not an integer, determine which integer it's closest to, and then graph the very best of your ability. So we're going to graph negative 5 thirds. Remember, negative 5 thirds, okay, negative 5 thirds is approximately, actually, not even approximately, it's exactly negative 1, okay, same as negative 1 and 2 thirds. So it's somewhere between negative 1 and negative 2, closer to negative 2 than it is to negative 1. So here I have, here's negative 1 and here's negative 2. I'm going to put approximately right there. That's about two-thirds of the way. So this would be negative 5 thirds right there. The square root of negative 8, negative square root of 8, I should say that probably, because the square root of negative 8 is an irrational number. Negative square root of 8. Well, the square root of 8 is between okay, the square root of 4, which is 2, and the square root of 5, which is 10. Right, because the square root of 4 and the square root of, of well, square root of 4, which is 2, and the square root of, uh, excuse me, square root of 16, which is 4. Right? Square root of, the square root of, actually the square root of 9 is smaller. The square root of 9 is 3. Right? And 8, if I just looked at the square root of 8, if I just looked at the square root of 8, it would fall between the square root of 4 and the square root of 9. And the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of 9 is 3, so the negative square root of 8 is going to be somewhere between negative 2 and negative 3. Since 8 is closer to 9, it's going to be closer to the square root of 9, which is 3, so we're much closer to negative 3. Okay, so the negative square root of 8 is going to be very close to negative 3, so I'm going to put it approximately there. So it's, that's the negative square root of 8. And if you wanted to, you can put that on your calculator and get the decimal approximation, which is about negative 2.8. So yeah, it's very, very close to negative 3. And last but not least, we have negative 2.3. Negative 2.3 is less than negative 1 and 2 thirds. Okay. Negative 2.3, eh, 2.5 is halfway, so 2.3 is going to be approximately right there. I'm going to put it down here so that you can see. Remember, I'm going to put the lines here so you can find this. Remember, when you graph on a number line, you have to fill in the dot because that's very important because later on in this chapter, we're going to find out, you know, we're going to graph inequalities, which will either have an open circle or a closed circle. So that's the graph of those three numbers right there, which means you can order them very quickly. You can tell me the smallest number is negative square root of 8, the next smallest number is negative 2.3, and the largest number is negative 5 thirds. Okay. Simply done when you put them on a number line. Okay. Which, now we're going to get into ordering numbers. The number line is helpful for ordering several numbers. However, for two numbers, it's easier to just show using the inequality symbol. And okay. we're going to compare using the greater than or less than symbols. All right, square root of 85. Well, now I know the square root of 81 is 9, and 9 is bigger than 8.9, so the square root of 85 is bigger than the square root of 81, so I know the square root of 85 is bigger than 8.9. Simply done. Didn't even have to use my calculator. I am trying to teach you right now not to become calculator dependent. Use your brain, because there will be many times throughout the school year you're not going to be able to use your calculator in my class. I will make you do things without using the calculator. All right, 11 and the square root of 130. Well, let's just look at this. 11 okay, squared is 121. 12 squared is 144. So the square root of 121 is 11, and the square root of 144 is 12. So I know that the square root of 130 is larger than the square root of 121. So I know that... The square root of 130 has to be larger than 11. So, square root of 130 is greater than 11. Now, let's look at something and think about it. It says, let A, B, and C be real numbers, such that A is less than B and B is less than C. So, how do A and C compare? Well, if A is less than B, A is less than B, and B is less than C, then it proves the reason that A has got to be less than C. Okay. A has to be less than C because A will be the left of C on the number line. Okay. So A is less than C. 
because if a is smaller than b and b is smaller than c, that makes a have to also be smaller than c. Okay, the properties of real numbers are relationships that are true for all real numbers, except in one case, zero. One property of real numbers excludes a single number zero. Zero is the additive identity for real numbers, and zero is the one real number that has no multiplicative inverse. There's your exception. You can add zero to anything and it doesn't change anything, but there is no multiplicative inverse of zero. Okay. There's no multiplicative inverse of zero. Can't happen because there's nothing that reverses zero. Zero is just zero. Okay, so let's look at a few properties of numbers. These should be reviewed again. Okay, there's a lot of things that should be reviewed. Properties of real numbers, where A, B, and C represent real numbers. Closure property. Sometimes you've never even, some people say, I've never even heard of this one. This is supposed to be review. Closure just says if A plus B is a real number, then A times B has to be a real number. If you add them together then, and they're a real number, if you multiply them together, they have to stay a real number. They cannot become an imaginary number. And that's all that's saying. Commutative property is one you should be familiar with. A plus B is the same as B plus A. Order does not matter with multiplication or addition. It does matter with division and subtraction. But the, the order in which I add numbers or the order in which I multiply numbers does not matter. 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. The associative property, how you group numbers. Remember, who you associate with is your group of friends. So who you group up with. Okay? I can have A plus B at added first and then add C. That's the same as taking B plus C first and then adding A. Let's use some real numbers because that so often helps. If this is 1 plus 2 plus 3, I'm still going to get 6. Here I have 1 plus 2 plus 3. I'm still going to get 6. It doesn't matter how you group them, you're still going to get the same answer. Only with addition, only with multiplication. The identity property says a plus 0 equals a, and 0 plus a equals a, and 0 is the additive inverse. Okay. If I add 0 to anything, it does not change the original problem. That's all that's saying. The multiplicative identity is 1. The additive identity is 0. Okay. 0 is the additive, it should say identity, not inverse. Zero is the additive identity, and one is the multiplicative identity. Because one is, what, do I, what can I multiply any number by and not change the original number? One. Okay. The inverse, a plus a negative a equals zero. In other words, what do we have to do, what do we have to add to something to get it to become zero? Or what do we have to multiply something by to get it to be zero? Actually, to get it to be one. Okay. So, the inverse of negative five is five. The inverse of negative 5 is 5. The inverse of 2 thirds is 3 halves because the multiplicative inverse has to equal 1, the additive inverse has to equal 0. And last but not least, there's the distributive property. And if you remember, the distributive property uses both addition and multiplication simultaneously. We can add two numbers together and then multiply them, or we can distribute this through and multiply. For example, if I said that A is, let's just use 1, 2, and 3 again, if this is 1, let's, let's just let's use 2, 3, and 4 because that makes it a little better. So this is 2, and this is 3 plus 4, that's going to be the same as saying 2 times 3 plus uh, 2 times 4. Okay. 3 plus 4 is 7, 7 times 2 is 14, this is 6 plus 8, which is also 14. Okay. And that's the distributive problem. Now, you need to be able to determine which property is which. If I look at something, I have to be able to say, oh, that's the commutative property of the addition. That's the associative property of multiplication. Okay, which property is illustrated by each of the problems? Let's look at this. X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y. The only thing that changed was the order. And order is commutative, and this is multiplication, so this is the commutative property, and I'm going to bring the of multiplication. And you have to tell me what it is of multiplication, addition, etc. Look at letter B. F, G is in parentheses, then H. And we, all we did, notice F, G, H stayed the same error. F, G, H, F, G, H. The only difference was here, F and G were in the parentheses, and over here, G and H are in the parentheses. So we grouped them differently. That would be the associative property of multiplication.
letter C, P plus Q, and then R is on the outside, and then we have Q plus P, and then R is on the outside. A lot of people look at that and want to say it's a distributive property, but it's not. Okay, if we look at it, notice, did what was in the parentheses change? No, you had a P and a Q in the parentheses before. You still have a P and a Q in the parentheses here. They're just in a different order. So order changed, but what you grouped did not change. So this happens to be the commutative property, and it happens to be the commutative property in addition. Because of the addition. I have commutative property of addition. Let's look at letter D. We have 5 plus y in parentheses and then the x after it. And then we have the x before it and the 5 plus y. So the same things are in the parentheses, the same things are on the outside of the parentheses. The only difference is the x changed positions. We changed from being at the back of the problem to being at the front of the problem, which means this is the commutative property of multiplication. The order changed. Letter E. 8 plus 0 equals 0 plus 8. Ah, we added 0 to something, nothing changed. Okay. So you could either say there's two, there's two things you could say with this. And a lot of people want to say immediately that it's the identity of it, the additive identity, but it really isn't. I would accept that, but it really truly isn't the additive identity, because if you notice, the 0 didn't go away. It just changed position. So this would actually be the commutative property of addition. A lot of people want to say it's the additive identity. I would accept the additive identity, but technically, to be the additive identity, it has to look more like letter F. If you look at letter F, you have V plus 0 plus W equals V W. The 0 goes away. Since the 0 went away, we know this has to be the identity of addition or the additive identity. Okay? And last but not least, letter G, where we have P parentheses Q plus N equals PQ plus PN. You'll notice we had parentheses, now we don't have parentheses. The only property in which you have a parenthesis and then you don't have a parenthesis is your distributive property. Again, all of this should be reviewed. You guys should have done this in Algebra 1, so this should just be a good review since you haven't had Algebra 1 for a while.